If you will, take your copy of the Scriptures and stand with me as we turn now in the book of Exodus to that portion of the law that we referred to just a moment ago. Exodus chapter 20, we'll read the first six verses of that text as uh, the basis for our sermon this evening. Before we hear God's Word read, let's bow and ask His blessing. Gracious God, even as we have sung together in prayer with the psalmist and all your church, rivers of water run from our eyes because men do not keep your law but have turned aside from it. O oh God, we pray that you would work within us such a heart of compassion and sorrow, true godly sorrow for this sin and disobedience, that our prayer might indeed be true. O oh Lord, we we do thank you that you have made your law known, and yet we confess that with all of your saints we have broken it in thought, word, and deed. And yet you have not judged us according to our guilt. You have not condemned us for our sins, but have rather punished your Son in our place, that our sins might be pardoned and we might be delivered. And we rejoice even more, O Lord, in the greatness of grace that has delivered us from our disobedience. We pray now as we come to your word and to your law that you would teach us as a redeemed people, that you would show to us what a life of gratitude is to be, that we would hear your law, O Lord, not as a word of condemnation, but out of the true conviction of those made new in your Son by your grace, made alive with your Spirit. Bless us and teach us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I almost forgot to stop there. We're so used to just continuing on. You were expecting it too, I'm sure, right? Yes. Seemed wrong to stop just after the second command, didn't it? In the New Testament, John closes his first epistle with these words that no doubt are familiar to you. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That last sentence almost makes you want there to be an appendix to the epistle. John, what do you mean? Keep yourselves from idols? Where did that come from? We haven't been talking about idolatry at all in the five chapters of this letter, and now you just drop an imperative like that upon us. Keep yourselves from idols. Are some of us uh, secretly stashing household gods inside our homes? Are we bowing down to gold or silver or wooden or stone objects? Are we offering a piece of burnt biscuit in a misguided ecumenicity with Queequeg in the mornings as we arise? I mean, where is this coming from? What does this concern arise out of? But the reality is that John understood, as we all should, that idolatry lies at the root of so much of our struggles with sin. Now, I don't want to go so far this evening as to say that all of our sin is, in an explicit or direct way, idolatry, and yet all of our sin in some way does seem to derive from or connect to, implicitly if not explicitly, a sort of idolatry as we make God in our own image rather than living as those who know that they are made in His. Gratitude in the Christian life is the concern of this third section of the Catechism, as we have emphasized over the last couple of weeks. And gratitude in the Christian life is to be defined and directed by God's commandments. And if it is God's commandments that are to tell us how we ought to live, we have to study God's law. And if we're going to study God's law, then we're going to have to pay careful attention to the summary of that law, which is found succinctly in what we call the Ten Commandments. And yet there is astonishingly, and always has been to some extent, 
hostility to that law within the Christian church. There is hostility to the idea that the law of God is good. Even if we pay lip service to that idea, we say, well, yes, yes, of course, the law is holy and righteous and good, but it comes to me as a minister of death. It comes to me as a minister of condemnation, and therefore, even if he is good, he does not seem to be good to me. And in many Christian circles, and unfortunately, in Reformed circles too often, you find that perspective upon God's law. And yet it's inconsistent with Scripture It's inconsistent with the early church. It's inconsistent with the medieval church. It's inconsistent with all of the reformers and with the second generation reformers and with the post-reformation divines and Puritans. In fact, this hostility to God's law, at least in terms of being uh, enshrined as a a larger perspective or a dominant point of view, it doesn't, doesn't come from any kind of orthodox place. And its widespread acceptance in Reformed churches is a rather recent thing. There have always been antinomians in the visible church. That has been true even since the days when Scripture was still being penned. But they've always been outliers. They've always been outsiders. They've not normally been leading pastors and teachers, much less entire segments of denominations. It's noteworthy, I think, that the historic and Catholic, small c, church, Roman, Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican, and Reformed has always regarded the Ten Commandments as central to the structure and character of the Christian life. I do not know of an exception to that. I would be happy for some of you to correct me on that. I don't think that you can, because I think that church history demonstrates that every Orthodox Christian tradition and even many deficient Christian traditions have acknowledged that the Ten Commandments is one of the basic pillars of the Christian life. This is why if you were raised Lutheran or Anglican before confirmation, one of the three forms that you had to memorize and understand were the Ten Commandments. If you were raised as a Roman Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox Christian, one of the forms that you were taught to pray regularly were the Ten Commandments. If you were raised as a Reformed Christian, then your catechism that you memorized was largely concerned with expounding and applying the Ten Commandments. When Martin Luther gave instruction and counsel to his barber about a basic pattern for prayer in the Christian life, what did he teach his barber to do? Every day pray through the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Those of you who were here last week for our study of covenant renewal worship might notice something interesting about that threefold uh, process, that threefold cycle. Cleansing, consecration, and spiritual communion with our Lord. And Luther said, pray through those three forms every day. Examine yourself, confess your sins, confess your faith, look to Christ, and then pray as one who is at peace in your soul with the God of heaven. The Ten Commandments have always been the Christian's friend. They are not our enemy. God's law is not a foe. Yes, there are three or so passages in the New Testament that speak about the law's power to condemn, the law's power to kill. But that is not the basic orientation of the Christian life in relation to the law. That is not how the psalmist teaches us to think about and to pray about the law of God. Yes, of course, the law ministers death to those who hear it as rebels, to those who are self-righteous, to those who would look to the law as if it were an instrument of justification. Well, yes, then it is only a word of condemnation, pointing out your sin and failures. Yes, it is true that the law is intended to convict you of your sin and drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But the law does that in a gracious and benevolent way. You say, what's gracious about the law? You don't think that the God who rescued you from Egypt, coming down, stooping down to whisper to you his will, you don't think that's gracious? You don't think that the law of God brought near to your heart by the Spirit of God in order to convince you that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself, you need Jesus? You don't think that that's gracious? You see, even in its condemnatory work, the law has a gracious context for the believer, for the elect person. Now, there is, there is no grace, I realize, for the reprobate. And I'm not arguing otherwise. I'm not suggesting that there's some silver lining for the reprobate who is shaking an angry fist against God. When he hears the law, he only hears condemnation, and he only ever will. But for us... When we hear God's law and are convicted by it and crushed by it, it's in order that we might stop trusting in ourselves and stop trusting in our idols and look instead to the Savior who can pardon and rescue our souls. And as believers, we hear the law in a very different context. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and that is why you shall have no other gods before me. Is because you are mine. You are my children. It is not a ladder by which you can climb to heaven. It is God who has come down, who has condescended, who has come near to the people He has redeemed. And He says, here is what life looks like now. You are mine. You live in covenant. You live before me. Here is what faith looks like. Here is what love looks like. Here is what gratitude looks like. And that law is not a ministry of condemnation. It is a ministry of blessing. It is a ministry of God's consecration upon His people. Tonight we're going to look at these first two commands, not in an exhaustive way by any means. We're going to focus primarily on their prohibition and warning against idolatry. The first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that does not mean that it is permitted to have other gods besides Yahweh or beneath Yahweh. Sometimes we read that in English and we misunderstand it. You shall have no other gods before me, but maybe, maybe that allows room for a, another god beside me, alongside of me. No, that's not the point. It's to say that there is, there is to be no other god in the field of vision. We stand before Yahweh and there are to be no other gods with us. No other gods in our life. We're not to have anything else in our back pocket. We're not supposed to be sitting upon the camel's saddle on top of the household gods that we stole out of the house of our reprobate father. The point is not none before me in rank. The point is none other than the true and the living God. And so the first command prohibits every kind of polytheism or any type of monotheism that might be centered upon any other god. The ancient world worshipped the host of heaven. They would lift their eyes to the sun, moon, and stars, and they would worship the gods that they found there. There are many warnings against this in the Old Testament. There are many warnings about this in the books of Moses as the children of Israel prepare to come into the promised land in the midst of the Canaanites who worship in this very way. Now, you might say, well, God prohibits worshiping the host of heaven because, of course, there is no host of heaven. But if you think that, you would be wrong. The Bible actually does identify a host, a multitude of spiritual beings who inhabit the heavens and who are even associated with the heavenly bodies. You can see this in English. You don't have to be able to read the Bible in Hebrew to to recognize that this idea of the host of heaven, the heavenly host, in both Old and New Testaments, that the, the text plays with that idea. In some passages you say, well, that is obviously the sun, moon, and stars. And in other places you say that is obviously angels and angelic beings. And in other passages you say, I can't tell which it's supposed to be. And it's because it's not usually an either or. It's more like a both and. But the Bible says that Yahweh made that heavenly host. There is a heavenly host. But they are creatures, they are not gods, and creatures are not to be worshipped. Psalm 33 and verse 6, By the word of Yahweh the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Which host are we talking about? The host of the heavens there. Are we talking about spirits, angels, demons? Are we talking about sun, moon, stars, planets? The answer is yes. Yes. He made them all by the breath of his mouth. They are subordinate to him. Secondly, the Bible says that Yahweh is worshipped by the heavenly host. 
They are worshipers, not ones who are to receive worship. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, You alone are Yahweh. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. I don't want to get distracted on this point, but, but you do realize that earth and everything on it is not just talking about rocks and trees and rivers. It's talking about people that are on it, seas and all that is in them. It's not talking about coral reefs and seaweed. It's talking about fish and whales. The heavens with all their host is not just talking about inanimate, immaterial stuff. It's not just talking about burning balls of gas billions of miles away, right? Third, Yahweh rules and orders the heavenly host. They do his bidding, not man's. Luke chapter 2 and verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. This was the night of Christ's birth, and the angels, the stars, came down and worshipped the Lord, and then returned to their places. Number four, Yahweh will judge the heavenly host. Their rule is not eternal, only the Lord's is. They do exercise a type of rule, by the way. This is an important theme in multiple parts of the Old Testament, and this is why the prophets describe the judgment of those hosts. Isaiah 34 and verse 4, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. You may have noticed that in biblical prophecy, very often when a nation or a city-state is judged, the Bible will talk about the sun being turned into darkness, the moon going out and not giving light, and the stars falling from the sky. It might not be celestial bodies that are being described, but rather celestial beings that lie behind those earthly powers. We're not to worship any god other than Yahweh. That's what the first commandment tells us. And we are not to attribute divine status to anyone or anything else. That is how we obey the first command. We recognize that Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit, is unique. He is alone. He alone is God, and he alone is to be worshipped as God. The second command is, Thou shalt not make any graven image or likeness of any created thing. Now, this does not mean that artwork of any kind is prohibited, although that is a common way of misreading that command. I get that question pretty regularly as a pastor. Nor does it ban explicitly religious art, as we will see. The point is that no representation of Yahweh is to be made, and specifically that no art is to be used in worship, for worship, as a medium of worship. The second command regulates the form of worship. It's talking to us about the manner in which we approach the Lord. The ancient world thought that images could represent the various gods that they worshipped. Now, don't misunderstand. I, I, I dare say none of the pagans, maybe a few of them, but none of the pagans, as a general rule, uh, were, were foolish enough to think that the piece of rock or the piece of wood that they bowed before was actually divine. Right? We, we, just like Isaiah says, we cut the tree down in the forest, we cut it in half, this half we use to cook our supper, this half we shape into a god, and now we bow down and say, you made me. Isaiah's mocking the foolishness of that, but, but what lies behind that is the pagan idea that now this image has become a doorway, a gateway. Yes, obviously, that uh, stone idol, that wood idol, that gold or silver, silver image is not itself deity, but it represents the deity. It stands here in his place, and whatever is said to him is offered to him, is offered through him to the true God that he represents. But Yahweh explicitly forbids the Israelites to worship him in this way. He says, you are not to worship me in this way, despite the fact that they have a propensity to do so, <laughs> despite the fact that they continually fall into this error in imitation of the nations around them. Exodus chapter 32, six weeks after they heard Yahweh audibly say, you shall not make any graven image, they say to Aaron, make us a graven image. And of course, Aaron, in his defense, he just threw the gold into the fire and out popped the calf. It's not as if he had anything to do with it. Why a calf? Why not an eagle? Why not a dragon? Why not something kind of cool? Well, they had seen golden calves in Egypt. They are imitating the worship that they have observed. Your children, by the way, will imitate the worship that they observe. You hand them over to Caesar 
for most of the waking hours of their life, they're going to imitate the worship that they serve. If you, if you leave them home uh, at, you know, uh, on, on the Lord's Day and you just worship without it, they're going to imitate the worship that they, that they see. If you bring them to the Lord's Day service and you say, now it's time to stand up, now it's time to open the hymnal, now it's time to say the creed, now it's time to say thanks be to God, guess what they're going to do? They're going to imitate the worship that they see. And this is how we learn to worship. We learn to worship by worshiping in imitation alongside of our parents, usually. Why is it that Jeroboam makes a golden calf, by the way, at Dan and Bethel? You would, you would think that he would say, this has been tried before, and it didn't turn out so well. But actually, he, he forms images at Dan and Bethel of golden calves because it's been tried before. Do you understand that? Because worship is usually imitative. The question is, is it going to follow the pattern that God has given, or is it going to follow some other pattern? And any other pattern is actually forbidden, That's what the second command is telling us. Now, several questions do arise inevitably about the application of this. Oftentimes, people will read this command out of their Bibles, and they will say, well, it seems not to have any images at all. Maybe maybe it's wrong for me to have pictures of my kids in, in my wallet. No, it's not artwork of all kinds. It is only representations of Yahweh. That's, that's what the text is actually saying. And it's not, it's not even forbidding religious art. It is not forbidding representations of the heavenly host. How do you know that? Because Yahweh explicitly commanded those kind of images to be created for use in the tabernacle and in the temple. Right? So, so we're not just speculating here. You say, well, pastor, I don't, I don't know. It seems pretty, seems pretty absolute to me. Then why does Yahweh in the very same books tell the children of Israel, get artisans to weave into the fabrics of the tabernacle to later carve into the walls of the temple these ornate representations of the cherubim and of the heavenly beings who surround us as we worship. By the way, that's what that's all about. That's what that's all about. When the priests go into the tabernacle and they look around at the curtain, right, which is dimly lit by the menorah that is there inside the holy place, what do they see themselves surrounded by? Angelic creatures. It's not just an aesthetic purpose. It has a theological purpose. It's to remind them, as you and I are to be reminded, that we are worshiping in the presence of the heavenly host because we are now standing before the face of God. And the same thing was true in the temple. God approves of that kind of art, that kind of religious depiction. He commissioned it in the Old Testament. But what he says very emphatically, very explicitly, is that no such representation is to be made of Yahweh. And no such image is to be used as a medium of worship, as a gateway for worship. You are not to look at that image and pray toward that image. You are not to set up that shrine or that icon and light a candle and have your devotions here as if through this doorway we can access heaven. The only way you access heaven is through the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. And the Heidelberg Catechism does this really well, by the way. They really treat this commandment in a helpful way. Now, does this... This, does this forbid depictions of the God-man, our Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, Christians have disagreed on this for many, many centuries back uh, to the latter ecumenical councils, as they are called in the early church, and they continue to disagree about this to this day. But I believe that the answer is that yes, the second command forbids images of Jesus as well. And just briefly, let me explain to you why. First, Christ is Yahweh. He is the Lord who made heaven and earth. We have seen this so many times in so many different sermons that I don't think it it needs to be elaborated upon. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word by whom the worlds were made. The Word who holds all the worlds together. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus can say to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, not because Jesus is the Father, but because the Son and the Father and the Spirit are one, one God, Yahweh. And so in prohibiting representations of Yahweh, I don't see how we get around the idea that Jesus can be represented as if he were not Yahweh. I I think it's in part derived from an error of theology proper, that says 
Yahweh equals the Father, but we can represent the incarnate Son and the Spirit. I don't, I don't think that's the correct way to think about that. Secondly, no one knows what Jesus looked like, and so any depiction can only be a representation. You don't actually know what the God-man looked like. We don't have a photograph of him. And so if you make any image of him, you are making a representation, which is the very thing forbidden here. It might be a different thing if you had a Polaroid of Jesus. Right? If you had a Polaroid of Jesus, I'm not suggesting that you have to cast it into the fire necessarily. But the point is you don't have that. All you can do is make an image, make a representation. But that is explicitly what Yahweh is telling you not to do. If you did have a photo of Jesus, you cannot represent the divine nature of the God-man. Do you understand this? Now, someone might answer and say, well, yes, but pastor, the disciples that walked with Jesus, they couldn't see his divine nature either as if it were some physical appendage upon his incarnate form. No, but what they saw was the divine nature embodied. They talked to him. They interacted with him. They saw the divinity shining from within him in his words, in his life, in his miracles. And you can't see that. A photograph is a two-dimensional representation. And so even if you were, to ab- you were able to visually represent the actual appearance of Jesus, and by the way, in the Orthodox tradition, there is the idea that the early icons of James, the Lord's brother, look very much like Jesus and that we have some sense of what the Lord looked in his incarnation. There is, a, there is a long tradition going back to early centuries of this. And so you will hear that, that argument. I, I just I want you to be aware of that. If you ever get drawn into this conversation, you'll hear that argument. But let's say that we know what Jesus looked like. Let's say that we could paint him in an icon. You cannot paint the God-man. You can only paint the human appearance of Jesus, and yet that is not his fullness. It's almost a type of Nestorianism at that point. If you could represent the God-man, the incarnate Son, and try to follow me here, you would be obligated to worship that image. I actually think you would be biblically obligated to worship that image. The problem is that you are explicitly forbidden to bow down to an image in the second commandment. Now, why do I say you would be biblically obligated to worship that image? What do you see all of the demons doing in Matthew, Mark, and Luke anytime they get close to the incarnate Son? They always come closer. They never run away. They always run toward. They always bow down or do some kind of obeisance. And they always confess, either verbally or in the case of mute demons, by their actions, they confess that he is the Holy One of God. Every single time. Every single time. They worship the incarnate Lord. Why? Because they have to. Well, why doesn't everyone? Because man is a rebel, and most of the men in those stories don't actually know who Jesus is, including his disciples. They're just learning it. They're just seeing it. When the Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, how exactly is that going to be accomplished? Is is Jesus going to commission the largest, beefiest angels to go around and bow the heads, bow the the backs of, of rebels on the last day? No. All that has to happen is the Lord of glory has to be seen in glory. And every knee will bow. Every every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess what they have to confess. The demons can't do otherwise. And it's not because they're believers. It's because they are knowers. They know what sinful man doesn't know. They've seen the Lord of glory. And they're terrified of him. They remain in rebellion and they cannot help but worship. If you and I could somehow represent that, you'd have to worship him. You'd have to. You could, if you could image the incarnate God, you'd have to worship it. But the problem is, second commandment says, you're not to bow down, you're not to commission, you're not to make this kind of an image. What the second commandment does is it requires us to accept God's definition of the form of worship and not innovate. And what it requires is that we accept the image that God has given us. And this is an entirely other sermon or series of sermons, but I will give it to you simply in outline form. God images himself in the worship of his people by his proclaimed word, by his sacrament, and by the worshipers who are there, who are all his what? Images. You don't just have the divine image, you are the divine image. Right? 
You are an image bearer, but it's not as if that's a backpack that you're carrying around with you. It's who you are. You are the image of God in this world. God images himself in worship all the time. But the second command tells us don't go beyond God's own image. We don't need images to worship because God has made his presence known in other ways. Now, how do we relate and distinguish these two commands? All Jewish and Christian traditions accept the same text of the Ten Commandments. That's important to know uh, in our, in our uh, Psalter hymnals when we confess uh, the Decalogue on the first Lord's Day of every month. We uh, confess it from the English Standard Version. When I read it a moment ago, I read it from the New King James. You could read it out of any number of different texts and translations. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's the same text. There's not variation here. But different groups do divide the text differently. Jews will take the preface to the Decalogue as the first command, and then they will combine the first and second prohibitions as their second command. So what we think of as the first two commands, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make any graven image, they will take that as one command and make that the second commandment. Roman Catholics and Lutherans combine the preface and the first two commands, and make that their first command. And they divide the tenth command into the ninth and tenth. And you may say, what an absurd way of dividing the Decalogue. Whoever gave them that idea? The answer is Augustine. Um, I mean, you know, he couldn't be right about everything, right? It is a very ancient tradition. And before you, you know, just kind of badmouth it uncritically, just realize you're talking about Augustine there, okay? Those are ancient divisions, but I do think that the logic of the division that we see in the Protestant and Reformed tradition, and we also see basically in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, I think that our division is, is preferable, and I think the logic is more obvious, that we say the preface is the preface. It's not a command. It, it, is, it is the indicative from which flows the imperative. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, That's gospel. That's grace. And then following that, you have ten commands. And the first says you're not to have any other gods. And the second says you're not supposed to worship the true God in another way. And you're to treat his name as holy and you're to honor his day and so on and so forth. I think the, the logic of that organization seems obvious. These are the two forms that idolatry can take. These first two commands misidentification of the divine, and misrepresentation of the divine. We misidentify the divine by giving a divine status to something other than or in addition to the true God. We misrepresent the true God by honoring God in ways of man's devising rather than the Lord's defining. And those are the two things that these commands are concerned to warn us against. Now, I I love this part of the Heidelberg Catechism, this question, what is idolatry? It's a great question, and it's a great answer to the question. I want to just focus with you on that for just a few minutes before we finish tonight. What is idolatry? It's having something in which we trust instead of or alongside of the true God. There are are three basic ways that we can fall into idolatry. The first two are obvious. We worship another God or if we worship the true God in an idolatrous way. We know that those things are forbidden. But what about this idea of assigning divine status to anyone or anything other than God? The truth is that man is a worshiping creature and is disposed since the fall to make gods in order to worship. We don't know what happened to Moses. Yahweh terrifies us. Aaron, do something for us. Make us a god to go before us. We don't have time to develop this point tonight, but idolatry is always an attempt to make the infinite and terrifying finite and relatable. So if I drop you into the middle of the ocean so that in 360 degrees you can't see land or anything anywhere and the bottom is miles beneath your feet, no matter how good a swimmer you are, that's an intimidating place to be. There is a sense of awe. There is a sense of wonder. If I pour a glass of water for you and set it in front of you, nobody is afraid. Nobody's intimidated by a glass of water. Same substance, right? The only difference is, you know, billions of gallons, right? 
But it's the exact same substance. That's what idolatry does. It takes divine substance, so to speak, and it compresses it. It says you don't have to be afraid of the God who causes the earth to shake, who causes the mountain to smoke. Right here, he's just a calf. He's just like a golden calf. Oh, he's a strong calf. It's a good-looking calf. But you don't have to be afraid of it. You see, nobody in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, when Yahweh comes down upon Mount Sinai, nobody is thinking about having a party. Did you notice that? Like, they're absolutely terrified. They're backing away. They're telling Moses, you talk to God. Whatever he tells you to do, we will do. But don't let God talk to us or we will die. But in Exodus chapter 32, when Aaron inadvertently draws this golden calf out of the fire, suddenly the people are playing and partying and fornicating and thousands of people die because they are so caught up in the frenzy of that moment that 3,000 of them don't even stop when Moses comes down and says, cut it out. And those are the 3,000 that the Levites kill. So that's the difference, right? The true God is infinite, awesome, terrifying. Idols don't terrify anyone because idols are relatable. John Calvin famously said in the Institutes, the human mind is, so to speak, a perpetual forge of idols, end quote. We're made to worship, and so we are going to constantly manufacture gods, and if we reject the true God, we will make other gods to serve. And that may be images of the true God, or it may be false gods, or it may be demons, or it may be religious acts of self-justification, but we are religious creatures. Everyone worships whether he thinks he's religious or not. Some people worship Vishnu, and some people worship video games. Athletes have religious rituals before and during games. I mean, you've seen this, right? They involve socks and how many times you tap the bottom of your cleats with your bat. What what is happening there? Liturgy. Like, liturgy is inevitable. See, I I don't really prefer liturgical churches. But you live in a liturgical world, so you're just going to have to deal with that. Everybody, every, everybody has those kinds of things. Why do we do the exact same things the exact same way every single game? It's because we hope to have the same outcome. Artists commune with and appeal to the muses for blessing. Even the most secular people are hell-bent on justifying their existence. They imagine that their life is meaningful because of what they do. It is an activity which defines their purpose, which confers fulfillment upon them. We call those kinds of activities religion. Even if it's saving whales and aborting the babies. If you say, I'd be happy if only, what? I cannot be happy without, what? I cannot live without, what? What is it that completes you? Any answer completing those statements other than God and his fellowship is an idol. I say, I'd be happy if only I had one million dollars in the bank. Or I cannot be happy without coffee and Oreos. Or I cannot live without my job or my hobbies or my truck or my books. Or I say, jujitsu completes me. Then I'm an idolater. And I've identified where my idolatry lies. And the New Testament does this, by the way. Paul helps us understand the circular nature of the law of God, the the unity, the holistic nature of the law of God. Because what is the first command? You shall have no other gods before me. Second command, no graven images. Third command, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Fourth command, honor the Sabbath day. Then we get into the second table. The fifth command, honor your father and your mother, which is the first neighbor that you have. Do not murder Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet, which Paul says twice in two of his letters, is idolatry. Covetousness, number 10, is idolatry, number 1. And we're back to where we started. Which also, by the way, is part of how you know that the Decalogue really is a summary of the moral law because it comes back to where it started. Right? So we've come full circle. Everything else in the law, we're we're running too many rabbit trails here, but everything else in the law is expounding one of those ten categories. Everything else. Everything else comes back to that. And you know because he ends where he began. And that means that envy for what my neighbor has been given by God is, is a form of idolatry. That means that idolatry can even be about how I think. How I feel. Not just bowing down to a piece of stone or wood, 
but the posture of my heart. Things cannot complete us. Things cannot make our lives meaningful. Only Christ can do that. As Augustine says, And man, being a part of thy creation, desires to praise thee. Man who bears about with him his mortality, the witness of his sin, even the witness that thou resisteth the proud. Yet man, this part of thy creation, desires to praise thee. Thou movest us to delight in praising thee, for thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. That's from book one of the Confessions. Probably the best known part of that work. How do we battle idolatry? Let me give you four ideas. First, we read our Bibles regularly and we let God tell us who He is. Worship is inevitable. You're going to serve the God of creation or you're going to serve gods of your own imagination. But reading your Bible regularly will help you train your heart to recognize the true God and reject what is false. You're going to get a sense of the divine, in in other words. You're going to get a sense of who God is, what God is like, what God desires, and you're going to get a sense when something is out of alignment with that. It's not infallible, obviously. Your perception of that is not. But the Word will train your conscience to discern between good and evil. Secondly, We should resist the temptation to idolize whatever is not God, but use the activities that we have been given as opportunities to do God's will. There's always a temptation to turn good things into ultimate things. You need to resist that temptation. There's also a temptation, maybe even more so in the Reformed community, to be ashamed of good things, (laughs) to be suspicious of good things, right? (laughs) I don't want to enjoy that peanut butter and jelly sandwich too much because I don't want to be guilty of the, you know, idolatry of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? Which, by the way, if you've not had, like, the organic raspberry jelly from Costco, that that might be a danger to draw you into that kind of idolatry. I mean, in Reformed churches, we find, like, idolatry everywhere. It's like, I I, I don't want to enjoy my life too much because then I'm probably an idolater. Who is it that gave you those good things? Don't turn good things into ultimate things. Don't reject the good things that God has given you. Instead, receive these opportunities with gratitude. Lord, thank you for giving me such wonderful organic jelly. Thank you for giving me another day to live. Thank you for giving me good friends to enjoy. Thank you for giving me a family whom I can love and be loved by. Help me to be diligent in those places, in those opportunities for your glory. Third, recognize and repent of idolatry wherever you find it. When you do find that you're trusting in the wrong things, repent of it and refocus your life. And that doesn't mean that you have to get rid of every good thing. But it does mean that they have to be kept in proper perspective in your spiritual life. I, I, I've realized that I'm beginning to idolize my appearance. I'm beginning to look too much at my appearance for my satisfaction with myself and with my life. So I've decided to get rid of all of the mirrors in my house. Well, I mean, I guess that's okay, but you probably don't have to go quite that extreme. It's probably okay to have a mirror in your house. But when you recognize that idolatry, repent of it. Repent of it. And refocus, reorient your perspective. And fourth, rest in the true God who spoke you into existence who saves and sustains you. Continually remind yourself, I am not my own. I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me say this as we close. Inadvertent idolatry is not a reason for terror. Did you hear me say that? Let me say it again. Inadvertent idolatry is not a reason for terror. It is a reminder to be thankful to God for His grace. You see, I'm just such an idolater, I turn everything into an idol. Well, that just means you're a human, and you're still breathing. But you you need to stop despairing. You're supposed to believe in a sovereign God who effectually saves His children. That you're not saved based on your performance. That you're not saved based upon the adequacy of your sanctification. And as long as we're talking about that, we have an odd and perverse tendency in Reformed circles to identify good things as idols, and we don't need any more of that. We really don't. We don't need any more Reformed worldlings warning us about the idolatry of marriage and family. Of course, marriage and family can become objects of idolatry. So can nourishing food and breathing air. But Reformed Christians don't need more reasons to doubt their own hearts or to question the goodness of what God has made and provided for your enjoyment. We are not... Gnostics, or we're not supposed to be. So we need to stop acting like we are. It's not idolatrous to love your spouse. It's sinful not to. It's not idolatrous to enjoy your kids. It is sinful not to. 
It is not idolatrous to work diligently at your job. And it is not idolatrous to be successful, even to be wealthy. You say, I just, I feel so bad that I've done so well in this world. I think you're supposed to feel grateful. I think that you're supposed to feel grateful. Sinners can make anything idolatrous, and it's right for us to be on guard, but making the hearts of God's people ungrateful and suspicious and sad is a sin as well, and it is a sin that more writers need to repent of than have so far. Christ has delivered us from the guilt and power of idolatry, both as exercised externally in cultural religion and also which arises internally through the lingering corruption of our hearts. But let us rejoice that the true God has made himself known to us and saved us forever by the work of his Son. He has done what no idol ever can, and he has delivered us from the tyranny of the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let's bow together. Gracious God, we are thankful that you have loved us, that you have made yourself known to us, that you have drawn us to yourself, and that you have revealed your law, that we may walk in the light of your love. We pray, O God, that you would work faith and gratitude in our hearts, true repentance, O Lord, and diligence unto holiness, the diligence that can only be the work of your Spirit within us. Bless us in this new week, O Lord, that your truth would carry us and inform us, would guide and sustain us in all of the efforts that we undertake. Bless us and use us for thy glory and for the blessing and good of thy people, and save us in the end, we pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.